Hello, I'm Kristen Eller, just Kristen. Welcome to my channel. I talk about science fiction and fantasy books and the awards that go with them. And this is my reading week journal for this past week. I finished two books this week. I finished Far From the Light of Heaven by Todd A. Thompson and When the Sparrow Falls in the Light of Heaven was an e-arc that I received from Nakalina Exchange for an honest review. And I really enjoyed it. I was also buddy reading this with a Goodreads group on Goodreads, obviously. They're called SFF Hot Off presses, hot off printers, new releases, which I'll link below. And I thought this was great. It was obviously just released very recently, like a week or two ago. It is kind of space opera. It is set in the future where we have colonized other planets, there are space stations, there are spaceships, and we follow a couple of main characters. Ultimately what hooked me with this book was just the crazy mystery. This is such a cool, weird, mind-boggling mystery. It takes place on a spaceship, there's been some murders, and it's I don't want to tell you too much because it's definitely one of those books that's fun to experience it. Um, not knowing a whole lot, but the world building in this is really kind of both minimalistic and incredibly expansive. Let's just sum up and say I really enjoyed it and I will get into a little more detail in the review. My audiobook that I was listening to simultaneously was When the Sparrow Falls by Neil Sharpson. This one did not work as well for me. I just, I was kind of bored and I really gave it a chance for a long time because there were some interesting problems and questions posed. I felt like this was leading up to a really interesting mystery, but ultimately I was kind of let down. The whole plot of what it was wasn't really worth the investment that you put into it. And I was ultimately really disappointed with the kind of lack of discussion properly of the problems and philosophical discussions kind of introduced. So the idea of this is that it's kind of a dystopian kind of Soviet feel Basically, in the rest of the world, r super intelligent AI are running entire countries, and so the, the biggest, strongest, wealthiest, most powerful governments in the world are run by AI. They seem to be running things well, but in the Caspian Republic, they have decided that they are humanist and they don't want to be run by machines and blah de blah. And there's also this thing where people are uploading their consciousness onto chips and living in like a digital world or in uh, synthetic bodies or something. And so that is also outlawed in the Caspian Republic. And so we're following a, a main character who is an agent working for the government to kind of track down and root out people who are uploading their consciousness and of course upholding their government which is anti being run by artificial intelligence. This is all super cool. It raises lots of questions like what are the pros and cons of letting an artificial intelligence run your country? What are the pros and cons of uploading your consciousness? Are you still alive once you've done that or do you die and then what continues is just a fake computer program? Are uploaded consciousness fake people? Are they real? What does it mean to be human? The classic sci-fi question I know. Um, I just felt feel like all of that was reduced to, and I guess this is a slight spoiler. I, it's not super spoilery though, so I mean, also I don't think it's good enough to like, you have to read it. So I'm like, I don't think you should go read it. <laughs> it was not that good. All of that discussion gets reduced to the Caspian Republic is such a repressive country and regime and it's awful, therefore they must be wrong about everything. So it just was not a nuanced discussion. Give it some credit. What it did do was show that ultimately any kind of intelligence is basically real. It, as long as it's intelligent, it it deserves like human rights, if that makes sense. So I don't know. It wasn't the worst thing ever. I rated it two stars though, because I really did not think that it was great or really accomplished what it set out to do. Okay, then I DNF'd The Route of Salt and Ice by, by Jose Luis Zarate. I was really disappointed with this one. I talked about it last week. I didn't read much more. I think I got to about 40, 45% mark. I really tried to give it a chance. Telling the story of Gila's voyage from, I think, Bulgaria to England and I haven't read Dracula, so I'm not like super familiar with that story or whatever. Apparently this was an episode in the original Dracula novel, and this book is kind of like telling the story that we didn't really get to see in that novel, but like we know what happened kind of thing. Um, and it's about the ship captain. And really the, the thing about this that drew me to it was first of all, 
it well first of all it was a pick for one of my goodreads groups it is by a mexican author it was sylvia moreno garcia actually had it translated by somebody else and then published it herself because she felt like this was a really important part of mexican literature and she wanted to like share it with the world and stuff or the english-speaking world and so i was really curious about it for that reason it's you know it's a mexican author writing something that is not traditional for mexican literature so it was really cool on that level you know sylvia moreno garcia was like behind it so i'm like okay i want to like see what this is all about vampires i could give or take i i don't really care but sure and then it was also supposed to be this captain is a gay man it was supposed to be kind of about homophobia and gay identity and stuff like that i'm like okay well that's cool too sure and in the foreword they the author and Mar sylvia Marina garcia both talk about how important this was for time that it was written it was written in 1998 and how homophobic Mexican culture was and how it was dangerous to identify as gay. Silvia Moreno Garcia talks about how she had a friend who was gay but had to keep it a secret or risk being fired from his job. Um, so it was important for those reasons and this book is very overtly sexual and it's very overtly about a gay man and his sexuality and his struggles and his identity so so far all of this stuff is super cool i'm super interested and then i start reading it and i was just so disappointed and disgusted with what i was actually reading because all of those things stand there all of those things are cool read it for those things you can read it anyways but i was very disappointed because the main character is very he's very racist and a bit of a sexual predator they actually use slurs in this book they use the word gypsy and sagani if i'm saying that right i'm not sure i'm i was totally unfamiliar with that word apparently that is a word that's more like a uh, european maybe eastern european for these are slurs for the Romani people and I admittedly um I need to educate myself more on what that whole history I admittedly it's very I'm sure complicated and not as simple as this word is black and white clearly wrong never ever use it I don't I I'm not educated enough to really say definitively I do know that at least part of the time it is very offensive and so I was surprised to see that there that it had been translated as such that it hadn't been changed. I'm open to explanations about that you know that was like ooh, I don't like that but at the same time I was like maybe there's an explanation okay maybe I'll get I'll I'll give it a chance you know but then the way that the main character thinks about these people is so dehumanizing it's absolutely awful the way that he describes them he talks about them being like slaves and being super subservient and it's just gross it's oh it really put me off and then he also like just goes up to one of them and just like licks and like kisses his neck like without consent he also prior to that had talked about how i mean in this is all in the context of he's really struggling with being a gay man and having gay desire and having to hide that and then he goes on to say how when he hires prostitutes he goes for the really young ones and ugh, that like really grossed me out too it's just like i want to be there to hear the story of a gay man struggling with homophobia and his own identity. I want to be there for unusual and interesting and important Mexican literature, but I don't want to be there for racism and non-consensual sexual stuff and underage sex. And one doesn't negate the other. You know, you can't get away with this stuff just because you're oppressed in these areas. You know, you you gotta. <laughs> uh. So that really bothered me and put me off and i just decided to dnf i don't feel like i can definitively say like this is a horrible book those are all the things that i finished or dnf i am working on a jade war and i'm making really good progress because i got the audiobook from my library so i've been i reading this and then when i have to go run around the house and do chores and stuff i put on my audiobook and i just keep on reading right so i am about that far i have this much left to read I am trying to get through this really fast because I have an arc of Jade Legacy, so I'm very excited to get to that, but it is super duper long. It's over 700 pages. I am really intimidated by how long it is. I'm worried that it's going to take me forever to get through because this one, this is, in my opinion, rather thick, and it's only 587 pages, so a book that's over 700 pages, like, oh, it's going to take me so long to read. I, I have 
an ebook of that, so it's, I'm gonna have to be eye reading it. But Jade War is so good. Uh, I would say it's like exceeding even my experience with Jade City. We are going deeper with these characters. We are learning more about the whole world. This world is expansive. I am blown away by what Fonda Lee is able to accomplish just in terms of world building. She doesn't only create one city with one culture that's really detailed and believable and rich. She creates literally an entire world. Like there is a world map in this book. The first book only had, well, it had the country map. So this is Cake on the Country. It had the city map. So that's Jean Loon. But this time, there is literally the entire world, the entire globe, and there is worldwide pol political things going on. There are characters in different countries now, and all of these different countries are just as like rich and detailed and well fleshed out as the original city of Jean Loon. And it's just like, I, I can't imagine how she did it. Like, how long does she work? I, like, this is such detailed work. And it's just, it's incredible. It's so immersive. The characters are so morally gray. Or maybe they're not even morally gray. They're just bad, evil, maybe. Except that you just keep on sympathizing with them. It's like, no, you've got to stop sympathizing with them. They're really not good. But also you kind of get their logic. They have a moral code. It's really messed up, but they have it. And they live by it and they believe in it. And just what this story is able to make me believe and accept and think about is just really interesting and it shows all different kinds of people and it's just all the different perspectives and characters and everything is fascinating very high quality fantasy right here so really enjoying that i also i just barely started the christmas proposal by lisa moreau which is another nut galley arc i like went way too crazy with the nut galley thing like i just signed up a few weeks ago i got really excited i'm like ooh, look at all of these books that i can just get and i got all of them i wasn't expecting to get approved for all of them but i was and i just i went and requested more thinking well they're not going to keep on approving me but they did and then i finally got my first rejection and oof, that hurt my heart. I was like, I am not a person you reject. How dare you? Also, it was a rejection for an audiobook, which I wish I could have explained. Like, yeah, I have a lot of unread books here, but my audiobooks go much faster. So you should give me the audiobooks. I went a little bit crazy and I have too many arcs and I'm, I'm getting through them. But yeah, so the Christmas proposal is one because I had decided like, oh, I'm interested in maybe trying a Christmas romance for the Christmas season. I love Christmas. I love, you know, just getting in the holiday spirit and whatnot. And I thought, ooh, a holiday romance might be a really fun thing to read as a holidays approach. So I got this one. I just barely started it. Oh my God. Oh my God. <sighs> okay, just a pigeon flying into the window. No big deal. I know you guys come for the drama, right? Um, I'm not loving this book. It's okay so far. I'm hoping that it's gonna get better because right now I'm not really into it and i'm starting to realize like there's a reason i don't pick up romance a lot because i don't actually love it that much i have to really be in the mood and the mood only happens like once a year or so i'm a little bit regretting my choices here <laughs> but yeah hopefully that'll get better and hopefully i'll finish that this week and let you know all right so that is everything that i've been reading i guess i could tell you what is next on the docket once i'm done with jade war i'm obviously going to start i reading jade legacy but for audiobooks i do have from the library right now hopefully i'll get to it in time immunity index by sue burke so that's what i'm gonna start next after jade war goes back to the library but anyways that's it thanks so much for watching i hope you're also having a great week and i'll see you next time bye